All right, does everybody have their questions ready? You want to find a chair? We've got the panel of speakers I have a question here. for you. <laughs> yes, I so do. We've got some mics with the directors that they're going to pass around out there. So raise your hand, get their attention. But have your, <laughs> have your questions ready. So we're going to start off here. I think Tom has a question. I do. We'll start with him. Okay. This one is for Dr. Christine. Uh, uh, having to do with the core microbiome within a seed, you yeah. talked about earlier. Can you hear me? There we go. There we go. Now we're live. Having to do with the core microbiome within a seed, if I buy seed that was produced from seed that had uh, insecticides on it, will it affect the seed that I'm planting that has not been um, covered with, with insecticides or chemicals? Yeah, if I bought if I bought the seed, and that seed was produced from a plant that had nanocides on it, will it affect my seed? Affect your seed. Uh, anyway, uh, sorry. Yeah, I'm just trying sure, to get the sure. question clear. <laughs> I'm just trying to answer the question here. Um, understanding the core microbiome of the plant has huge implications, right? Because it's in the seed. Right. So people who keep their own seed and seed that's like adapted, plants that are adapted to the way you grow mm -hmm. things, will find that over time that your seed will actually produce better and better results because the core microbiome is improving. Mm -hmm. If you're doing things that improve soil health, there will be more microbes that are free living in the soil that will enter the plant mm -hmm. and end up in the seed. So you're going to increase the number of microbes in the core microbiome in the seed. Whereas people who are putting insecticides and fungicides on the seed, mm -hmm are reducing the core microbiome in their plants. Over time, those seeds are going to get less, less and less bigger. Okay. Yes. And the plant will still germinate and grow, but it won't have very good stress tolerance. It mm -hmm. won't be as tolerant to stresses like drought or frost mm -hmm. or waterlogging or any variation on that, right. you know, any extreme. And it also won't be as uh, resistant to pests and diseases. So we've bred out a lot of those tolerances by reducing the core microbiome without even realising we were doing it. Because we've had several generations of selection under very high chemical levels, right. particularly well fertilisers, for example. You know, most variety trials where people are, are selecting varieties of crops are grown, you know, were undertaken on a research station somewhere and they'll be heavily fertilised. Source. And even that has a big effect on the core microbiome. So that we find that modern varieties of things oftentimes are not fit for purpose really mm -hmm. in terms of being able to communicate with microbes in the soil. And one classic example of that is um, many <coughs> modern cultivars don't form relationships with microbes or fungi, for example. Because okay. they've just lost the ability to do that. Hmm. Thank you. So it's a great question. <laughs> Or Christine? So do you put your own seed there? Yeah. For so do you want to make a comment on that? Like, do you find any improvements over time with keeping your own seed? So, uh, oh. Question okay. four. Uh, oh, maybe you have any help, but maybe uh, Dr. Jones. Um, but can a soil be self sustaining without uh, adding uh, removed nutrients? Remove, remove the nutrients to grain, obviously, and be self sustaining if you don't replace those. Okay, so the question was, can the soil be self-sustaining with, with removal of nutrients? Is that, is that sorry? Is that you remove the nutrients in the grain without adding additional nutrients. Okay, so can I ask you a question? What is your soil made of? So let's talk about the top, uh, with say 50 centimetres, what's 50 centimetres, 18 inches? Yeah. Uh, the top 18 inches of your soil. Uh, 60 would be <laughs> two feet, yeah, oh, 20, 20, 20 inches, 20, soil, there you go, for example. 20 inches. Can you tell me over one, oh, I'm going to get confused here with acres, one acre of land and the top 20 inches of soil, can you tell me what's, what you've actually got there? Oh, you've got thousands of tons of something, right? Mm -hmm. You've got, yeah. I can't tell you how many thousand tons because I can't do it in that imperial. Right, soil, but, Okay, so the 50% of it, that is soil, is going to weigh several thousand tonnes. You've got several thousand tonnes of something per acre. Well, what is that something? 
not the air, not the water, what is that 50%? Well, and, and there's tons of it. There are several thousand tons of stuff that you're going to grow plants in, and it's called soil. What is it? Made of? Minerals. But so what, what are those minerals going to be, for example? Phosphorus. Phosphorus. Calcium. Magnesium. Sulfur. Potassium. And lots of And them. other things like iron and aluminium and silicon. Silicon, I should say. So, um, <laughs> if you looked at the total amount of minerals that were in one acre of land and you look at the amount that goes out the farm gate in your product, it's a tiny, <coughs> tiny, tiny fraction of the total that's there. The problem is that 99% of what's there is not plant available in a water soluble form. So the issue is that a soil test is going to tell you how much nitrogen is water soluble, how much phosphorus is water soluble. It's not going to tell you what the ability of microbes in your soil is to fix atmospheric nitrogen and the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, which means I think in imperial terms you're going like 30, 33,000 pounds per acre or something floating around above the ground, which is a lot. <laughs> And that you just need to have the microbes in the soil that are able to fix that and turn it into a plant available form with things like phosphorus and potassium and calcium and magnesium and sulfur and all of those things they will be in your soil, but they need to be made plant available. And the only way they can be made plant available is with microbial activity, and the only way that you can get microbial activity is with plants. The plants don't take from soil, plants build soil. There's only one thing that can build soil, and that's the microbes that are supported by plants. The first step is to have the plants, and then we have to look at how many microbes are around those plants because plants that have got lots of chemicals on them aren't going to do what plants can do without those chemicals. So there's a few things that we have to change to get that system to, to function, but the amount of product that goes out the farm gate, or the amount of mineral that goes out the farm gate in your product is a tiny, tiny fraction, a tiny fraction of what is actually in your soil. And in order to make what's in your soil available, you need microbial activity. And the best way to stimulate that is with plants. I mean, how did the prairie work? Thank you. And sure, the, uh, the minerals weren't being exported in that case because things lived and died on the prairie so that everything got recycled. And that's the argument that people give now as well. It's all very well to talk about the prairie, but now we're taking things off. Like you're taking off a tiny, tiny percentage what's there. The other thing is that if you're managing your plants and you've got a diversity of plants and you're managing them in such a way that there's lots of root exudates that actually will stimulate microbial populations in the soil. Remember microbes can multiply really quickly. Remember that the air is 78% nitrogen. So the air is free, the water is free. Sometimes it comes when we don't want it, sometimes we don't get it when we'd like to but basically it's free, the sunshine is free. So what we're doing is encouraging green plants to photosynthesize and turn carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into themselves to build themselves. The cellulose that they build from carbon from the air is the most common compound on the planet, probably because plants constitute 450 of the 550 gigatons of biomass, that's just why cellulose is so common. But they build themselves from the air. They build themselves from nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon from the atmosphere. And only a very small percentage of what they're made of comes as minerals from the soil. And those minerals that they do take from the soil become available because they feed microbes in the soil to make them available. And most of what grows on your farm doesn't actually leave your farm. Only a very small percentage of that goes off in product. The rest of it, you know, like if you harvest in grain or something, it's only a portion of what you grew, isn't it? It's not all of it. So if you grow a green plant and it produces grain and you take that grain away, the rest of the plant and all the exudates that came out of that plant's roots are of bones. If you had bare ground with nothing growing in it, you're not adding anything to it at all. If you grow a green plant that gets almost everything it needs from sunlight and the air, builds itself from things from the air, 
photosynthesizes, feeds microbes in the soil, builds soil, you're actually ahead by having a plant there, even though you, even if you took half of it and, and sold, you know, even half of the weight of it went off as, as grain. You're way ahead from, ha from having that run and having, not having a plant there. That, that, that whole thing about stuff going at the farm gate is an absolute myth. It's totally incorrect if you do the math on it. It's the other way around. The more plants you grow, the more soil you're going to build and the more assets you're actually going to have. I've got a quick question over here for uh, either any of you three. Uh, in corn production systems, we're all about, you know, or can be about infro, a pop-up fertilizer. Are we seeing, is it true, I guess, that when we're applying, uh, especially any sort of synthetic, but we are having a disassociation with the fungi, uh, with the roots, and not being able for them to communicate in, again, in cor mostly corn production, I guess is my main question, but just what have you guys seen? Can you elaborate on that? Corn guy? I will say this, we're using less and less pop-up. Uh, none for our summer crops, cotton, corn, soybeans, we don't use any at all. We're still using a little bit in wheat, uh, trying not to use any, but we're doing it more for a problem with, uh, with acid, acid soils, low pH. So we're, you know, the more, the further we go along, the less that's a problem. And I've even found, as far as uh, pHs are concerned, that the longer I've been in no-till, the less I really have to worry about a pH of even five and a half. That really becomes a non-issue. I'm not sure why, maybe you could explain that a little bit more. But uh, um, I use very little phosphorus anymore, very, very little. And, and part of the reason that I, I've gone close to cold turkey on that is because of listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of years ago at No Till on the Plains, uh, you gave, gave a great talk on how phosphorus can <coughs> inhibit microbiology activity right around that seed. Um, so, so no, I'm not using much anymore, and, I've, and I just don't need it. A uh, good friend of mine, long-term no-teller, grew continuous corn for years and years on the same property, and he was a geologist from OU. Don't hold that against him. I do, but you all don't have to. From Oklahoma University. And he said, why in the world are you using phosphorus? I said, well, my soil test tells me to. He said, well, I don't. My soil test tells me the same thing, but I know that I've got 3,000 and so many pounds of phosphorus per acre. He said, if I stay no-till and I keep a healthy soil, then the soil's gonna supply it. He said, don't ask me why, but he said, I know how much I have and I'm not gonna buy anymore. And he hadn't for years and years. Had the best yields that I know of anybody in the county uh, on corn. So I was just gonna tell a little story about Ray Wood because he's not here. But, um, <laughs> but that's fine, I know it's been, I don't know, no, it's not been, yes, it is being tagged, all right. Well, that's okay, because Hi, Ray. Ray knows that it really happened. <laughs> He's not here, is he? <laughs> but that's um, Ray Ward of Ward Laboratories in Nebraska. And uh, I was giving a talk last year with uh, Jay Fuhrer, I think might have been there with Green, green Cup Seeds. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ray was quite happy, like, sitting there, you know, not in the green with all the stuff about green plants and, you know, mm -hmm. it's all good and everything. And then when I got to the bit about phosphorus, it's like, ah, oh, he says, oh, I'm sorry, Christine, he says, but that's not right. What you were saying about phosphorus is not right. So I said, well, Ray's got a ranch and, um, you know, he's always conducting soil tests for, you know, like our and other people, I suppose, and his own. I said, do you know, on your own ranch, how many parts per million of total phosphorus do you have? And he said, yes, I know how many parts per million of total phosphorus I have. I said, okay. So, and you know how to do the math. I said, you sit down and you work out and tell me how many parts, like how many pounds of phosphorus are going out the farm gate, and what that relates to in parts per million of phosphorus, and how many thousand years worth of phosphorus you have in your soil. And he's like, oh, yeah, thousands of years. <laughs> anyway, so he sits there and does the calculation. And then he doesn't make eye contact with me. It didn't take me very long to work it out. Then he's just looking all around the room and he's not looking at me. And I thought, oh, I'll just let him sit there for a little while. About 10 minutes later, I said, so Ray, how many thousands of years worth of phosphorus do you have on your ranch like, without adding any? And we, I think it was like 70 pounds per acre or something was going out the time day. The weight was a lot going out. He said 17,000 years. I said, well, 
You've probably got enough for a little while and you may not need to add any to you. <laughs> so I think that pretty much um, satisfied that argument. You, it, the point is, you have a huge amount of phosphorus in your soils, but it is a very, very reactive element. If any of you did chemistry in school and you fiddle around with phosphorus, I mean, it's something that can explode. It's, you know, it's like, it's a very reactive element. Things that are luminous, uh, luminescent, like marine bacteria that, you know, shine blue mm -hmm. and things like that, or probably, I don't know where the glowworms and, and those kinds of things, I don't know whether they use phosphorus, but a lot of Lightning bugs. Well, Lightning bugs, like, maybe? Yeah, do they use phosphorus? I don't know. I would guess they do. So it it's looks a very like reactive it's the right color. And it's not just going to be floating around in the soil as phosphorus. Because it's reactive, it's going to link up with something else. It's got a negative charge. It's going to link up with something that's got a positive charge, like calcium or magnesium or iron or aluminium or something, and it's going to form an insoluble compound, like iron phosphate, aluminium phosphate, calcium phosphate. It depends on the pH of your soil, which one of those things it links up with. And once it's found with those, it's not going to show up on a soil test. It's not an available form of phosphorus anymore. So if you want to break that bond that's formed with calcium or iron or aluminum. manganese or aluminum, yeah, you call them what, aluminum. <laughs> aluminum. 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 Yeah. <laughs> well, we call it aluminum. Anyway. <laughs> um, we'll leave that one out. But, like even calcium is a common example. So if you, if you have calcium phosphate forms, pull calcium out of solution, pull phosphorus out of solution, and plants can't get either of those things. So what are you going to need to actually break that bond? You need an enzyme. Enzymes are capable of all kinds of extraordinary things. Microbes produce enzymes. That's one of the reasons that microbes are very, very important for uh, releasing elements in your soil. Microbes can produce an enzyme called phosphatase. Phosphatase enzyme breaks that bond. Then your calcium is available, your phosphorus is available. And then you've got other microbes that are able to transport, like mycorrhizal fungi. The main thing that mycorrhizal fungi bring back to plants after water, the main thing they bring back to plants is water. Second most important thing they bring to plants is phosphorus. Through that, using that phosphatase enzyme or providing carbon to the microbes that use that phosphatase enzyme or manufacture <coughs> that phosphatase enzyme. And then the third most important thing they bring back is zinc. So we often see phosphorus deficiencies and zinc deficiencies going, going together. So in Australia, where we see farmers put a lot of phosphorus fertilizer onto um, cereal crops, for example, knock out their zinc microbes and fungi, then there's zinc deficiency. Zinc deficiency. You apply phosphorus and then you've got a zinc deficiency. Or you apply phosphorus and you'll have a selenium deficiency. We see those kinds of things all the time. Then you have to apply the selenium or you have to apply the What you really needed to do was stop applying phosphorus in the first place, mm -hmm. stimulate the microbes in the soil by maybe putting a biostimulant on the seed instead of putting phosphorus into the seed. So Derek, you use biostimulants, like you use, um, you're using vermi liquid and compost extract and those kinds of things. Um, and when I was lucky enough to be uh, on your farm last year, it was last yeah, year, it's only it's six months summer, ago, yeah. actually, it wasn't that long ago. Um, we saw amazing rise of sheaths mm. on your plants and beautiful things like happening in the soil. So I don't know whether you want to make a comment about how you've kind of moved a little bit away from, I mean, you're still using some fertilisers, but you've reduced, I mean, you, you mentioned in your talk about how you've reduced it. I mean, do you want to say anything about but what your I know you showed some great photos of what's actually happening biologically around you. Right? Sure, sure. So what we're doing now, we we came from a low salt starter. That was what we were using prior, and then when we got into the vermi, like the, these liquids or the compost extracts and furrow, um, four years, three years ago now, I guess it is four years ago. We we made the switch, and yeah, we've been monitoring our mycorrhizal fungi since then, and then I mean they're as good as they have been. Um, I guess like for a fertilizer comment, I guess, closer, this is better. Okay, I'm getting to move it closer to your <laughs> mouth motion. Um, yeah, so we made, uh, as far as fertility re reduction, and we just keep lowering it. I mean, we started higher than we are today, but we just keep backing down. You know, we, we use a little bit of, of ammonium sulfate ahead of our, our cereal, so if people want to know what we're really using, that's the form of N we use. We started at like 120 pounds of product, and then I just kept going lower and lower, and we're at 80 pounds of product ahead of our cereals, which is basically half of our farm now. 
So it's like 16 units of N. And from what we're seeing in our SAP results, I think we just, we're going to probably start doing, well, I did do some zero trials this year, so that'll show up in next year's crop. We apply it in the fall, just for a workload perspective for us. And then that's as far as synthetics go, that's what we're using. And then in our, in our liquid that goes in furrow is just some micros, and they're all, it's just a salt-free micro, I don't know, whatever, micronutrient, I guess, right? So anyway, that's what we've been using, and we've been, yeah, we've been seeing that's probably the biggest noticeable thing we've seen is is the change in the rise of sheaths. Like it, it was something that I struggled to wonder if we're ever going to see them, but now it's yeah, it's we're, yeah, we're seeing them quite regularly. So, Gary, guys, last night at uh, at dinner you said that uh, and I've heard this before. Christine touched on it, but you always like to plant your own seed back, mm. and, it, and that's and, and would you expand on that just a little bit? <coughs> Yeah, it's, it's something that, we, and we've seen it again this year. Um, so we're pedigree seed growers besides the, so there's some things I have to buy, like I can't use my own. So we, when we get a new variety, like we have this Maverick Barley is one example that we grow, and I have to buy foundation or, or breeder seed, you know, that's super high level, and then we'll grow it from there and then all the way down to certified. And when we get that stuff as certified, it's, oh, and again this year, it was, it's if, if I have a low yielding, disappointing crop, it, that's the one. And then from there, we always try to keep our seed and, and grow it down as many generations as we can from there. But it's, it, was, it was noticeable again this year. Um, something we've struggled with, and I, I, we've tried even different seed growers, but at least most conventional seed growers have the same practices. So from, yeah, that's, that's what we do. So we just try to buy as high a generation as we can. And once we become select growers, we'll be able to get seed, right, like the, the five kilograms and start at a higher <laughs> generation so we can get it into our system sooner. But yeah, that's something we've seen. And even like the one barley, I, I even wonder about, we should, Tannis, did we look at mycorrhizae on, on the, we didn't this year on the Maverick. No, we need to do that because I've got concerns about that because that one really sticks out as a bad one for us. Where everything else seems to perform pretty well in our system, these, the, that one was, it really stood out as a poor performer. So we should be able to get by the, across to the consumer that it could be healthier grain. Yeah, so the comment was, yeah, we can get across to the consumer that it's healthier grain. And that's something we started measuring, you know, and there again, we don't know what, you know, we're just measuring mostly um, sort of for like a starting point, right? Because we don't know what is good. We just know that this is what we have on our farm. And we're going to continue to measure and, and hopefully it, it continues to get better. I know one of the things that Jill talked about was a baseline for zinc, you know, that sort of somewhere in the 30 ppm range was good and we're seeing our cereals kind of in the 40 somewhere so we're higher than that and I you know I don't know there again I mean there's so many questions to that it's that's its own conversation but yeah it's something we've been measuring and we like we like to use that too as sort of a scorecard for how we've been doing you know in our in our nutrient balancing back to our plants so we'd like to add uh, uh, warm season grasses into our rotation just for increased diversity and I'd like to expand on the exporting question that was asked earlier about the grain. We do not have livestock currently. We plan to add some but we would never add enough for our acres. So to have that warm season grass, the only thing I can think of is probably to bale it off. If we're exporting the biomass, is that going to be the similar answer to your grain exporting? That's not a big deal because a lot of people seem to think it is. Yeah, why are you planting a warm season grass? For diversity. Just for diversity. And, and, and it'll be a blend, I'm sure. Corn, but we only want so much corn on our farm. So to okay. get a warm season grass on a larger acreage, you know, the only option I see is paying it or grazing it. Right. You can only graze so much. Well, with your corn, you have a warm season grass. Correct, but I only want a small percentage of my farm to that. So if we're going to have more. If you want to increase diversity, you could intercrop on the corn that you have and then have a cash crop to sell. But uh, if you want to do warm season grasses, we do a lot of it, but we have a lot of cattle. So we're going to try to run that through cattle. But I have warm season grasses that I've planted. Let's say I'm too late to plant corn like this past spring, um, and I have preventive planting acres. I went in with you know eight-way blends of, of warm season grasses, and then I didn't you know, I'd planned on taking some of it for, for hay or forage of some kind, but if I couldn't get cattle to it and I didn't need the hay, which I didn't, 
I planted directly back into it. I was planting through 12 foot tall, um, probably 14 to 16 ton uh, stuff. I just planted back into it and I just let that stay uh, for armor. In my part of the world, I need it. I have to have armor on the soil. It's the most important thing. Uh, I think of the five principles. I think armor on the top of the soil for me tends to be the most important because we get so hot and we get really dry. And because we have built up a biological population, they tend to consume that very, very fast. So I need a lot of lignin type, um, type surface cover just to get through the next summer. So I don't mind leaving it. And so, but to answer your question, if you already have a warm season grass, you want more diversity, I would want to intercrop. Try to get something else growing in with it. We're, we're already interceding with farming over quite a few years, but still yeah. the corn is only a small percentage of our total acreage. Right. We'd like to get warm season grasses on a larger portion of our acreage. To do that and pay the bills, it seems like you're going to have to sell that. Yeah. And well, one kind of thing that, to, to answer your question, I think that whenever, um, Christine was talking about it. There's so many tons of parent material there that no, I don't think, I think you could, she said take half the plant, it wouldn't hurt. I think if, for, if you're not gonna do it every year, year after year, like they do in some of the plain stuff where they're going out into hay meadows, been hay meadows for 40 years, you see a loss of production. But I think that has more to do with decreasing diversity in native plains. Because if you keep cutting it off at the same time year every, every year, you're gonna lose diversity, right? You're gonna lose some of those uh, forb species and legumes that that are thriving out in the rest of your ranch. But for you, I would, I would say if you're not gonna do that every year, year after year, it certainly wouldn't ever tap into your total amount of uh, parent material. Do you agree with that? I was also gonna say that, I mean, without having seen your operation or anything, it's very hard to like, comment on it. But you know, as Tom pointed out, you already have a warm season grass, and diversity is incredibly important for your soil microbiome. So if you were going to plant something else, I'd recommend a mix of maybe you didn't even have any grasses in it. Um, and you could maybe uh, throw some flax or something in there to give you a bit more, because um, Derek was talking yesterday about a flax will grow with those other things over the summer if it's provided it's got some shade. So you put sunflowers and things in that have, you know, big leaves to provide shade. There was a, um, I just got an email from a farmer in Zambia the other day. Actually, he was looking for someone to go to Zambia and give a talk about soil health if anyone's interested in coming to Zambia. Um, but he has just cropped land. He doesn't have any livestock. And he has been growing an eight-way mix that included things like cowpeas and soybeans and uh, sun hair and those kinds of things on one third of his land, no livestock, and his total profitability has improved as a result, like he's rotating it around. Um, because he's got a massive improvement in infiltration. And they're in a low rainfall area. Um, what's 500 mils again? 15, 16 inches. About 16 inches of rain, uh, if they get 16 inches of rain. So they've had three years of drought, and they haven't even got 16 inches of rain. He's been the only farmer in his region that's grown a cash crop. And he's been able to grow a cash crop because he has this multi-species cover of broadleaf plants that he rotates around. So, you know, even with your corn, do you grow it on the same area every time or do you move that around? No, it rotates, but it, it will take, like it's uh, less than 10% of our total acreage. So we'd like to add, you know, get up to at least 25% so that every three, four years we've got a warm, warm season, cool season. Oh, so when you say you only grow a small amount of corn, you mean you grow cool season crops as well? Correct. Right. Oh, I was wondering why you had all that crop land and you're only growing I'm, I'm 40 land. miles from Canada. Yeah. Ah, oh, This right. is my goal. <laughs> I see. Okay. Just very similar to Derek, except I'm uh, further east. Like top of Are you able to it? We, we could, certainly. We don't have power right now bring in enough to do that. So I'm just wondering what your thought is on bailing it, because then we could sell it for a profit. Is it is it a small thing or is it a big thing okay. that we're giving away? So just profit? to give you an, uh, an example, just from Australia on that, of people that don't have livestock, wanted to grow covers, wanted to build soil. There's been some experiments done, not by you know research stations, but like people doing experiments on their farms. 
where they've grown a diverse multi-species colour and baled it, like made, um, we say bale it, to, to like make, make hay out of it and sold it compared to just letting it go right through to maturity and then just living on the land um, like a farmer on the soil. They've actually built a lot more soil by baling that mm. um, because what happens then is it regrows, provided you plant things that will regrow after you plant them. <laughs> And then it's in that earth, in that regrowth stage where it produces lots of exudates. They have built like three times more carbon with wow. the exudates, and you still take the material off. So now remember these hay fields in the United States that have lost structure and lost carbon over time because people are haying them. They're taking everything, and they're only mostly like oh, it might be. Um, well, in Canada, you'll see timothy and things like that that's been grown, or timothy and alfalfa grown together or something for haying. And that's all that's in there. Might be just straight timothy or timothy and alfalfa. You haven't got the diversity there, and then you're removing all the biomass. So you're losing diversity and you're, and you're losing biomass. Like you're just, you know, taking everything away. If you have a really diverse mix, you can hay it. And you can actually build more carbon by haying it all grazing it and leaving it there. Is that hanging it when it's in the reproductive state or in the vegetative state? Vegetative very kill it. Uh, yeah, you're going to hay it before it switches over, hopefully. So it would be... Yeah, it depends what kinds of plants you have in there too, as to whether they're going to recover from, from being cut. So again, you know, there's things like alfalfa, obviously, and timothy that you can cut that will regrow. So you need to look at what kinds of plants you put in there. Um, are they going to regrow after they've been cut? He said thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not functioning as it should because it's all been linked now to the gut microbiome. 
Now we all know those disorders are linked to the gut microbiome. It's exactly the same in the soil. So that people are using things like neonics because uh, there is a void in the microbiome. In other words, not enough microbes there to actually do the things that they they should be able to. And using neonics just makes it worse because if they go on to the seed, then that core microbiome of microbes that are in that seed, which gets less and less and less over time if the seeds have been the plants, you know, as Derek was talking about, you know, you buy a commercial, uh, like a, a um, seed. Um, yeah. What was the right barley. And like, well, yeah, it's just barley. not as vigorous, is it? It just hasn't got the fitness because of the way it's been grown. And that's why people are using these. I have one little comment. I have one little comment on it. Christy, Dr. Christy Morrissey is a research doing something at the University of Saskatchewan, where I'm from, and there's a really good TEDx talk that she did a research on um, birds that it consumed small amounts of canola seed that are treated with neonics, like we're talking one or two seeds, and it's affecting their weight, which is then affecting their migration ability. So if you look up her TEDx talk, it's quite good. So. I, yeah, I believe so. Her, her research was all on birds, um, but yeah, Dr. I think it's Christy Morrissey. I'm probably butchering it. Sorry, Christy, if you're watching this. Um, but yeah, it's a really good TEDx. No, I don't. Ready for the next question? I'm interested in how we can control noxious weeds as we make the transition to this soil health period. Oh boy. Oh boy. I guess I'll take a stab at that. Um, so interestingly, what, something we've noticed on our farm since we've made changes, um, and we're not sure if it's adding diversity or using less synthetic and or what exactly we're doing. Um, less disturbance obviously with lower tillage, you know, with our no-till system, you know, if we're finally getting to a maturity point, but weeds aren't nearly the problem that they used to be for me. And it's an unexpected benefit. Um, <coughs> our weed spectrum's definitely changed. Uh, things that used to worry me aren't the weeds that I have today, but we don't have any real yield takers like we used to. I mean, we still spray, don't get me wrong. We still use herbicides and we still use them as a tool, but it sure doesn't seem to be the problem that it was. Um, and we are using some like that, those chaff liners. It's, it's something, you know, it's something that I'm really happy with. It's a mechanical form. It's one more tool in the toolbox, something that we're going to continue to use. So it seems to help. Um, with us, you know, uh, I heard someone say, I think it might have been, I, I don't remember who it was, said that, uh, um, Pigweeds are just pigweed until they come resistant and then they're palmer, right? Because you can't imagine the thought of a redwood. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah, that's who said it. And uh, the thing is, um, pigweeds for me aren't always bad because cattle absolutely love them. So there's times whenever I can use cattle to manage some of those. Now that's, that's a different operation and that's down in Oklahoma, but we do have incredible infestations in areas of pigweeds. Uh, rye is probably my number one go-to. If I've got a field that has a problem with, with pigweeds, I'm going to use a rye blend. Rye, barley, a few brassicas, I'm going to get some diversity in there in the fall before I go into my summer uh, planting, whenever I might have to worry about those. Uh, we also still use herbicides. Uh, I rely on some residual herbicides and I would love to see the day when I didn't have to. But uh, the interesting thing is in our native grass, you can drive around all over. You can drive for 30, 40 miles out there. You're never going to find a pigweed. And we don't ever spray for pigweeds in our native grass, ever. We don't spray for any herb. We don't spray any herbicide for <laughs> at least 10 years or more in my na native grass. I don't find any pigweeds out there. So it's definitely a management issue. Resistant weeds is a management issue. It's not that we need to go and, and find another magic bullet, a chemical, because what's going to happen within two generations of a pigweed, it'll be resistant again. So that's what they do. So it's a lack of diversity, I would say. What do I have that's incredible on my native grass that I don't have that's incredible on my farmland is diversity. So I would say we increase diversity, figure out a rotation that works a little better, and just keep it guessing. Keep those pigweeds guessing. You know, Mother Nature is amazing at that. And if you can, if you can um, confuse that system a little bit, that works. So my, my great take home for you all is 
I can say that I have an area of Oklahoma that has incredible amounts of pigweeds that's right across the river from the Arkansas River from native grass that has no pigweeds. So there's something going on with management. It's not necessarily a, a chemical problem. It's a management issue. So if I could just add to your comments, it's a great answer. And we see that all the time with, uh, of comparisons of, you know, there might just be a fence with mm -hmm. certain weeds on one side and they're not on the other. Well, obviously the seeds could get to the other side. And, mm -hmm. you know, the weeds could easily be there, but they're not growing there for some reason. So a seed is um, an incredibly aware being really too. Um, I didn't say anything about seeds, but when you think about seeds, again, you know, if you close your eyes and imagine you're a seed, you can't see, right? You can't hear, you can't speak. So you're a little bit like a micro. And you're there in the soil. And if you look at the native prairie, you'll see um, there are some seeds that will germinate at a specific time of the year. But that's the time of the year that they will come up. And they don't come up at any other time of the year except that. So how do they know what time of the year it is? You have to think about that. Um, in fact, and how do they know how close to the surface of the soil they are? So if you take a viable seed and plant it 10 feet down in the soil, it's not going to germinate. It's going to sit there for years. Some seeds are viable for a really long time. So in a few years' time, you could take that seed and now you're going to plant it like half an inch from the surface of the soil and water it something and it grows. But how did it know whether it was half an inch from the surface of the soil or whether it was 10 feet down? The seeds are very aware of the oxygen concentration in the soil. They're very aware of the light, the wavelengths that are coming to them. They know whether they're on the surface of the soil or whether they're buried. They know what kinds of plants are around them because they're picking up on all those molecules that I showed in the diagram that there's chemical signals going on all the time around seeds. And the seed knows whether it's in a native prairie or whether it's in your cornfield. Probably knows a lot more than what we do. And the seed in the native prairie is picking up all these signals like, oh my God, there's a lot of diversity around here and lots of different kinds of plants. And, um, there's a microbial environment that's not familiar for me because I'm something that likes to grow in a cornfield that's got a very simplified environment and mm -hmm. there's only one kind of plant I've got to deal with. And I think I'll just sit here. So you could actually take some of that prairie soil mm -hmm. that's across the road and you could spread it out in a tray somewhere and water it at the time of the year when um, amaranth would come up. Mm -hmm. And you find there's amaranth seeds in there, mm -hmm. but they're just not coming up in the prairie. So why they're not coming up there? and they're coming up across the road. It is all about management, and it's how we manage the soil environment. So if we make that soil environment more complex and we confuse plants by, you know, weeds by having lots of signals in there, lots of microbial diversity there, and lots of cover as well, so that you're not creating, you know, because they're picking up on wavelengths of light, they know whether they're in bare soil, and they know whether there's lots of different kinds of plants there. The seed is a very, very intelligent being. And it's, it's how we actually manage the soil to determine whether those seeds germinate or not. I have another okay, thing. so um, I'm here in eastern South Dakota and I'm in full state of corn soybean rotation. Uh, potassium availability is a big issue for me. Are there some uh, plant species or tools that I can use to improve my available uh, potassium? That's your job. That's your job, potassium. He's looking for potassium availability. Well, what I said before about availability of minerals applies to everything, uh, like all minerals. It's really a matter of, you know, if, what do what you rotate the soybean to, did you say? So you have two species there, okay, in soil that is, was originally prairie, was it? With five to seven hundred species there. So, there would have been a lot of different um, communities of microbes before that aren't there now. And it's like a lack of microbial diversity, that whatever microbes you need to make um, potassium available obviously aren't there for some reason. So you might look at having diverse colours between some of your crops or um, interceding somehow, you know, I'll chat to Derek about. Um, Polycrops or even just 
planting something before you harvest to have it in that short window of some kind of diversity. And if you're going to do that, I'd put as many different kinds of plants in there as I could, like 20 species or something. And you might be amazed at how that will actually affect the available of these animals and so on. I don't know whether you want to. I do have something to add. You know, one thing I didn't get back to on my story whenever I was talking earlier was this particular field that I told you I had, I had such a hard time planting and I had so much different stuff in there and I finally got it all planted out there to put in a perennial and it was very diverse. Uh, what I didn't say was that, that we didn't put on any phosphorus other than what we had to to try to make it feed which really wasn't that much. It's mainly wheat and what was amazing about that crop was that whenever it got towards harvest I could see that all these wheat plants were becoming mature. And I thought, well, there's plenty out there to harvest. It's thick. It, it looks pretty good. But there's also quite a bit of brome grass that was wanting to head out and, and all kinds of different stuff. There's a lot of red clover. Um, there's even some canola out there that was trying to head out. And I thought, well, we'll get a stripper header. We'll go out there and strip it. That field, which had never made more than 25 bushels in the history that I could remember and really in, in the data going back, made over 50 bushels of wheat in combination with all those other plants. It beat the county average by about 15 bushel with less nitrogen and an incredible amount of what was considered competition by anybody that would have looked at it. So there, there's this incredible benefits that we can have from diversity that, that we're not seeing. And I don't think I've seen it yet. I don't think I'm anywhere near. I think this is increasing my soil quality at an increasing rate and we're 21, 22 years in. And, and a lot of that has to do with diversity. And I'm not saying you have to go plant a 16-way blend. Maybe I do. But I try to keep my costs pretty low too, especially now, commodity prices are pretty low. But I do think that there's something to be said for diversity. And I think it's huge. So we have seen um, massive improvements in drought tolerance in diversities as compared to monocultures. I usually have those slides in my presentation where you put them in there today, but have you seen videos of any models that usually in there? So just going from like a monoculture of a crop to um, like a, a cocktail mix or a multi-species mix in a very dry year, the monoculture has failed and the multi-species mix is like what, what drank. Just right. no symptoms of any moisture stress at all. I'm not sure how many different kinds of plants you have to have to achieve that, and I'm not sure how many different functional groups. Obviously, you, you want to have as wide a diversity of functional group of, in other words, di really different types of plants. Mm -hmm. Something in the daisy family, something in the pea family, something in the grass family. You know, like as many different kinds of plant families as you can. Most of the work I do these days is in pastures, talking to people or dairy farmers and things like that with, with pastures and we find like to really get different kinds like chicory and plantain and things not just having grass with some clover in it you know right. that's not enough diversity you really have to and if you look at the prairies and look at the flowers that were in them remember the prairies were about 10 to 15 percent grass the other 85 percent was non-grasses and mostly flowers um, lots of daisies and things like that were just things in the days. Obviously, a sunflower or a classic example of that. But probably not so many legumes, really. So starting to think of some things that are not grasses and not legumes, I think, is a challenge for some people to find, find plants that fit into that category. We like plantain and, plantain and chicory are very important to our operation. We, we use quite a bit of it. But that had a lot to do with my son, and he knows how much deer like plantain and chicory. So we're going to throw some of that in there. And, uh, and it's been really beneficial, not just for the whitetails, but for, for all wildlife and, and, and the soils. I'm sorry, this might be a little unconventional, but this morning I had breakfast with a fellow. So you're sitting right there, and you had a really good story about this. Would you mind sharing that again with the group about the corn and the multi-species cover before the corn? And I don't remember the details, but I remember it was awesome, and you fit, there was big changes, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> can someone get him a microphone? I, I don't know if I'm ready to go public. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> it was really good, anyway. So anyway, it was diversity plus corn equaled really good, so <laughs> it was a cover crop before, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Should we leave it at that? Yeah. Okay. Didn't mean to put you on the spot there. <laughs> he isn't far enough away from home to tell his story. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, you got to be 100 miles to be an expert, Where is that right? this? Just cut that out. <laughs> well, this, my, my question does lead into the cover crop before a cash crop and fertilizing. And you, Christine, you're talking about you want to stress the cover crop so that it puts more in the soil. So do I not want to fertilize that? Or how much do I fertilize? And then on the cash crop, uh, I got to fertilize that too, right? I can't rely on the cover crop to put all the nutrients there, or can I? I would really recommend using a biostimulant. I would never put a synthetic fertilizer on a cover crop because you do want to stress it and it will actually build more soil if you can get more exudates. You want to really make that plant work. Don't put it on welfare. If you put it on you know, synthetic chemicals on something or synthetic fertilizer, you're putting it on welfare. And make it work. That's what you're putting a cover crop in for. You want it to work. So you want as many different, like I said, functional groups, different leaf shapes. You want to harvest as much light as possible. And you really want to pump as much of that carbon that's been uh, accumulated during photosynthesis into the soil. You're not interested in biomass. You're not interested in, you know, having the biggest body cover crop in the world. You actually want to build soil. That's what you're putting it there for. Make it work. Make it build soil for you. Above ground growth doesn't necessarily equate to what's happening underground. You'll find that something that maybe that's really struggling um, and working hard to stay alive will have a really big root system provided you didn't put fertilizer under it and maybe not that many leaves. So don't be put off by the fact that something didn't grow so well above ground. Take a look at the roots. Really spend a lot of time digging holes looking, looking at what's happening under your plants. But if you did put a biostimulant on it, um, on the seed, preferably, or in Faro is the next best thing, um, you will see better root growth, you will see more riser sheaths, that's an indication you're getting a lot more exudation. The plant will be more drought on it if it happens to come into the situation of um, being deficient in water, or in a waterlogging situation it will also survive better as well. Survive waterlogging better, survive drought better. In other words, the fitness of the plant is going to be hugely improved. The biostimulant is going to make it build more soil, not less, whereas the chemical fertiliser will definitely result in less soil building. So if you could, you make your own biostimulant um, or just buy something cheap, but, you know, it just depends how much time you want to put into, into doing that. Milk is a great biostimulant, for example. You might be able to get some of that from somewhere um, or buy out-of-date milk powder. Skim milk is fine. You know, out-of-date, you can buy it by the tonne in Australia. So just look up biostimulants, try and, try and find something cheap. And then you might find that if you've used a biostimulant and, and diversity in your cover, and you've really made it work, and really made it build soil, that's going to help a lot with your cash crop too. And sure, you can't go cold turkey on N, particularly if you've been using it before, you can't just cut it out and expect that you're still going to get the same yield because you won't have the nitrogen fixes won't be there. Takes them about three years to actually build up sufficiently to, to be able to supply all the N that your crop needs. You can go cold turkey on, your, on phosphorus if you're using that. Um, so diversity by stimulant and then with your cash crop, just start experimenting a little bit on cutting back on things, not in all of it. You know, just in like part of it have it with lower rates. You know, don't cut things out altogether, just go lower and see how you go. Have you got a yield monitor? Oh, okay, so <laughs> if you've got a yield monitor, is it that common? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait, okay, wait, so wait, I mean, wait. if you've got a yield monitor, you can see straight away on the yield map what's happened in terms of you know, how many units of fertilizer that you, you've used. It's very hard to tell by eye, because by eye, we can't, you know, humans can't actually even detect a 20% difference in yield. We can't see that by eye. But um, you'll want to bring that up with it. So if you haven't got one of those, you might just have to do some cuts, you know, cut some, cut some areas and weigh them or something to see what, what effect it's having on your, on your brain. And then, of course, I mean, you're still going to get your total yield. And then you need to look at profit. It's more important than your yield. Like, I couldn't say that often enough. Your profit is more important than your yield. And you, you might find if you cut back on some of those inputs that you'll have less need for other things too. Less need for insecticides and herbicides and 
herbicides and you know university and building your soil microbiome and really making those covers work for you is going to mean less inputs into your cash crop and more profit and that's really the number that you want to be looking at is how much did I make not how much you did I make or what was the yield it's not really that close to the profit I wouldn't mind making one more comment on that. I think she, yeah, that's absolutely on the right track. I think everybody has the ability to, to do their own, you know, trials, cut your fertilizer back, you know, fool with seed rates, whatever. But uh, on our farm, most of the gains that we've seen in, in, in profitability come in, in terms of reduced inputs has come from on-farm trials. What, keep what I can do on my farm. And it's been eye-opening. And that's what, probably what's advanced us as fast as it has is doing it, you know, make setting up actual, you know, what's it called, you know, official results, you know, so you have replicated trials, right, so you do it right, you know, so you're not lying to yourself because there's nothing worse than that, and and doing the trials, cutting it back and taking the time, and it sucks at harvest, you know, because everybody just wants to go back and forth, but you take the time and that's super powerful information. So if I just comment on that, uh, having come from a lifetime of research, <laughs> Uh, and having done things like go out into a field and say, oh, I'm just going to put this down here or have a different rate for this year and I will remember where I put this. Because <laughs> this was, you know, five posts from the gate or something and it was that post and the next one and the next one and I'll remember that I did that. And you come back in six months and you go, oh, was it the fifth one or the fifteenth yeah. one? You just, um, maybe it's just my brain, I don't know, but you need to use some kind of markers or uh, if you start putting on farm trials or keep really good notes, write it down somewhere. I just can't emphasise that enough of really you have to know exactly where you did something and when you did it and how much of it you applied mm -hmm. and all that. You have to have good records. Very true. We do that with our um, 2630 monitor. Uh, we do quite a few acres of research every year. Um, 500 to 700 acres a, a year in our place is going to have some kind of research, large block trials, uh, 30 to 40 acres at least a piece, and we take the time to stop and plug that into the 2630 monitor, then we have it on our as-planted maps. It doesn't take very long, it's, it's pretty quick, you absolutely will not remember it. And by the way, my biostimulant has four legs and four stomachs. That's what I use for a biostimulant. And I have those suckers running around out there. I don't like buying more stuff. I'm tired of buying stuff. And, and if you could make your own, awesome, awesome. But be very careful with bugs in a jug. Be very, very, very careful with that. Because they'll promise you anything. They'll promise you anything to get you to write that check. So be careful with that. I just happen to I want to use a, a biostimulant that has four legs four stomachs, and, and then I do buy some chicken litter. I buy some chicken litter at times, and I find that that really helps ahead of my soybeans. Don't know why, just have, that, that's where it really, really shines. I put that on my, my cover crops in the winter. Uh, Any time in the winter, I don't care when it is, we don't have a foot of frost on our ground like you all do. But if it's dry enough, we run it, and, and that's a great biostimulant, I think, for, for our area. Um, so I'll just add it to that time when you have um, livestock or any kind of animals really, could be chickens or wildlife or anything on, on the soil, the soil microbiome is able to detect, like, as well as the fact that manure has certain, you know, hen pk, et cetera, things mm -hmm. in it, urine has, you know, like you can analyze it and see what all these things are. And saliva is very, very important. Like uh, an animal grazing a plant has a different effect to cutting the plant. Mm -hmm. um, can have even up to a 20% increase in regrowth rate from the saliva mm -hmm. uh, because of all the enzymes and everything. So the plant is responding to that. Remember plants know stuff, seeds know stuff, microbes know stuff. They're all the time detecting all the signals that are coming to them. That's, that's what's impacting on their growth. So you have animals there, that manure and that urine and, and, and the hair and, and um, Skin, like the, the scale yep. of their skin all the time. You know, like soil is aware of the fact that there are, there are living animals there. Um, it's not just the nutrients that are in the manure. So it is a very, very effective biostimulant because soils are meant to have animals in contact with mm -hmm. them. Soils have co evolved with plants and animals or integrated into that one thing. But 
Having said that, there are some people that don't have livestock and, and not in a situation where they can, particularly in some parts of Europe, it's just not possible. They'll be surrounded by huge highways or whatever, mm -hmm. and the area that they have, they just can't even get animals in there or out of there, so it's not physically possible to have them. So there are some places where you can't have animals on the land, and um, for those reasons, there are other things that you can use, mm -hmm. um, like Derek and Tanners make their own biosimulants, um, there are more and more people now that are making their own lives in them, so it's not necessarily something you have to buy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, it, it is a great way of, of definitely improving the, increasing the diversity of the life of mm -hmm. And it can pay you to do it, mm -hmm. I mean, especially like um, Derek and Tannis being able to cut back on their synthetic birds mm -hmm. by replacing them with a the, the I don't know whether you wanted to comment on <coughs> Uh, we keep mineral out. I think it's more habit <laughs> than anything in doing it for so long. Uh, they know when they need it. They know when they don't. And it's somewhat of an indicator of my, of my soil health. Uh, they don't eat very much at, at times. Certain times a year, they won't, they won't touch it uh, for long periods of time. As far as the mineral is concerned, uh, it's the same way. Uh, cattle are amazing at choosing what they need. You know, they know what they need. Kind of like your soil biology knows what they need and you give them a diverse ration out there, then there's not much need to feed them anything else. The worst thing you can do on a good diverse, let's say uh, winter rye, barley mix, you got a good diverse mix out there, the worst thing you can do is go feed them a, a bale of straight hay or a bale of oats. You can back them up pretty quick. You can stop them from, from a half of their gain by giving them a straight oat bale at the wrong time. So you want them out there grazing what they want. You know, you don't want to have a, an oat bell and bring the cattle in if you don't have to and force them to eat oats, you're going you're gonna to kill their, their, their gains. So uh, cattle are an amazing deal and, and, and really the way creation is, it's just amazing how if you get everything in a balance, how things start working. Um, I will say this, that at the first five years that we were in no-till, uh, we were still planting a lot of stuff, we were still running cattle, but we didn't have near the diversity. We were still planting just wheat and running cattle on just wheat. And we'd follow that with double crop beans. We'd follow that with corn. Uh, whenever I was in the middle of it, I was uh, actually spoke at no-till on the plains. It's been probably 15 years ago. Dwayne Beck beat me up again. <laughs> he said, you got 10 years, it's going to fail. It failed in 10 years. Didn't have near enough diversity in it. Okay, everybody got the question? No. So, so, okay, so the question was, okay, I already forgot. <laughs> Squirrel. Um, yeah, legumes so. And the, legumes and cereals. Oh, right, the legumes and cereals, gotcha. And then if we use polymers on our cover crops or the seeds that we mix with our annual crops? Okay, so we'll start with the legume cereal mix. It doesn't work for us, and I'm not sure why. I've tried about every combination that I can think of that would still allow us somewhat of a weed control option. Um, every time I add a legume, if I get 10 bushels of peas, I'll get 10 bushels less cereal, and I'm not sure why. But that's what we've, we've basically been seeing that. So if we're, if we're separating, I mean, I got enough things to do without having, you know, to do that. So we just, we just gave up on it, and that's where I got the whole idea of, inner, you know, putting our, interceding our covers into our standing cereals. Like, let's add our diversity there. I guess was sort of how the idea came. Um, yeah, the, the legume four, like the flax, whatever, flax, flannel, th those, those all work. Those have been proven long-term. We always get a benefit out of that. Lots of ways, yield, you know, improved health, all those things. But then as far as adding polymers to the, to, we have never done any of that. I mean, it, like to do the, the delayed seeding or the delayed emergence, we haven't done anything with that. Generally, I wanted to grow like if we seed it in the spring, we do want it to grow um, at the same time. And we'll just select things that will work in the herbicide program that way. Or else if we don't want it till later, we'll, yeah, we'll just seed after. Like 
we try to seed the like the diverse cover crops after the short like the, as soon as we harvest i guess we'll try to seed right behind i and on those i guess in that situation I'm not sure if that answers you seem to see that uh, we use a lot of legumes in our wheat but ours is winter wheat we're planting in the fall and we're going to graze it so we've got radishes and, and uh, canola that we'll throw in there, uh, buckwheat. We're planting early enough, we can have buckwheat blooming in the fall before we even get a frost. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we do a lot of that with no intention of harvesting any of that for seed. We're gonna just harvest our wheat seed. So, so I have no intention of harvesting that stuff for seed, but I am gonna harvest some of it with cattle and give my cattle diversity in the winter. And I, I hate to keep harping on that, but if you don't have cattle, there's somebody close to you that does. Work a partnership. <laughs> I mean, you, you can actually make a little bit of money back off of that, uh, off of that crop, and, and maybe that would be a better option than haying it. Uh, I guarantee you, if you get enough cattle out there and you graze it hard, you're gonna build more soil than if you even mowed it. What do you say, maybe 20%. There are people that have cattle, and there's, there's always people that have cattle. And I love this cattle exchange that South Dakota's doing, something like that, what's it called? Grazing exchange. Man, we need that in Oklahoma. I would love to have that in Oklahoma, but, but we don't. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. Amazing idea. Get on there and say, hey, I've got all this stuff to graze. One thing I would try to keep in mind, especially first few years of no-till, uh, maintain the right to tell them, hey, we need to pull the cattle off for a couple days. Because not so much that I, I'm not worried about compaction with cattle at all. What I am worried about is disturbing my seabed for my next crop I'm gonna plant. And, and I have seen issues with that, but that's the only issues I've had with, with the disturbance directly from cattle, and that was only in the first few years. Today, I've got cattle running out on wheat. If we get a big rain, and I know that I've got some real flat, um, heavier soils, I might pull them off for a day or two, but it doesn't take very long at all. They're right back out there. Uh, so, so that's what we do. We do use a lot of legumes, uh, uh, red clovers, uh, vetch, it's awesome to get a whole lot of vetch in, your, vetch in your grain tank whenever you're out there harvesting wheat. You know why? Because the vetch is worth 80 cents a pound and the wheat's worth 10. You know, it's worth, it's worth so much more money. So clean it out and sell it. Uh, we had the opportunity of, of harvesting a bunch of rye with barley because we thought we were gonna spray it out and plant cotton. We couldn't, preventive planting. We go out there and harvest it. It's worth $12 a bushel. My wheat's worth three or four. It's, it's, it's an opportunity. Mm. I never thought about clovers. Yeah, so we totally do that. Sorry, if you were thinking about clovers instead of large seeded legumes. So we do, yeah, like I, I'll put a sweet clover for us, which maybe doesn't work for everybody, but yeah. it's a tough, it's just the one great grandpa used, right? The old one, we tried all the fancy exotic clovers and uh, I'm back to red clover and sweet clover because they work and they'll actually, they'll work herbicide wise and they'll also, they, they'll keep up enough. And when we strip that it, it, sometimes it's nearly as tall, but if it strips, it's, it doesn't seem to interfere. And if we want to kill it later, we can, but it'll grow back great in the fall. So those are the ones we use, yeah. And that won't affect yield. But if we put a faba bean or a pea in, then it, it'll hurt us yield-wise, so. It increases my yield. Really? Having those legumes in there increase my yield significantly. Well, yeah. But it's all right. Yeah. That was interesting because yesterday, I'm glad someone asked that question because when you said you couldn't get the legumes in the cereals, the grow together, so you can get all the legumes when agriculture first started, like people started growing crops in Australia, which, I don't know, 100 years ago or so. Clover and cereals were always grown with clover. And that was in the days before yeah. nursing and nitrogen fertilizer, and cereals were always yeah. grown with clover. And I thought I had a novel idea. <laughs> because, you know, they started using clover synthetic hen and just clover just dropped out of the system. Yeah, I guess I live in a bubble because I thought it was rather novel of me a few years ago to start putting this stuff in there. <laughs> so yeah. I come to a deal like this and find out how half the country is doing. <laughs> Sorry, so just to clarify, yeah, like with the clovers, is, it, it works great. Small seeded legumes, those work great, but if I put in the big ones, that's the one that parts me. And I, I think for me, it's just a, I run out of rain. Like we, usually we end the season super dry and I'm sad, right, because it didn't rain enough, but that's I think what gets us at the end, that those legumes just run out of gas. I got a question uh, for internal external parasites and livestock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> are you treating for that? And if you are, what are you doing? Trying oh, wow. I was really hoping no one would ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yes, I am um, on my native ground, and I think it's a problem. Um, I really need to do more work in that on my cows. Um, what, what are you, what uh, we use Cydectin. We use, we use Cydectin. We don't spray for flies very often, but my, my head guy, my, my cow puncher, so to speak, amazing guy, pretty smart guy, man, he just loves those cows, and he sees flies on them, and he'll have them sprayed three times sometimes before I know he did it. Have you ever sprayed garlic? Yes, this year, first time. First time we started putting garlic in the mineral, but you've got to get them to eat the mineral. You know what I mean? And they're not wanting to eat the mineral very much. So, so you really have to get them to consume a certain amount of minerals so that they eat the garlic so that it has an effect. So we didn't have a lot of effect uh, with but garlic. In the tub, lick tub, molasses base. Yeah, like yep. sounds good. I didn't know about it. I like the sound of it. Let's find I'm out. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh, Cydectin. Yeah, we use Cydectin. Yeah, what, from what I've read, it's, it's less toxic than some other things. So we use Cydectin. Uh, we have run a lot of stalker cattle, and I don't always know how clean they are coming in. But uh, now that we've identified our sources better and we're developing relationships with the herds that are coming in, uh, I can get a lot better at that. But that's something we've really started doing heavily in the last two years is that we're going to stick to certain herds. There's about three or four herds, and I hope to have gained one here, uh, so that we can monitor that back to the cow a little better. But if you could do a rotational grazing and break the worm cycle, that would help it too, though, right? Yeah, we do that. We do that. Uh, I, I think it's like an ounce of prevention. My dad always did it. It's the same old story. It's the same old story. Well, that's what my dad did. He always wormed the cows. So I'm still worming the damn cows, and I, and I probably don't need to. We still have dung beetles, but not, not a massive amount. Not like I can remember seeing whenever I was young. I used, whenever I was a little guy, I thought they were the coolest little things, you know. You'd watch them scoot this poop around. It's amazing. I don't see them like that, but we still see them. But, but there's definitely not as many today as there was 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, but I thought I shouldn't because I'm sitting next to you. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Um, so I make them a little school you know, and you're as well. Yeah. It's not as bad as I would make them. Right. Right. Uh, and the other thing is, do you do fecal egg counts? I was going to... No. Um, no, I need to. I guess yeah, I need to. Yeah, so fecal egg counts, pretty straightforward. You can learn to do it yourself on a microscope, okay. um, just to see whether you actually need those. Okay. Because you could be affecting your damn feeding population. Oh, I know we have. Problem. We used so Ivermate for 10 years, and I didn't uh, see any. We got the third crop of small grain in with the corn and beans in a no-till cover crop rotation. The uh, problem is the small grain after a wet year um, was just disease-ridden, low yield, lots of weeds. And uh, so what, what could I do this spring when I plant another small grain crop, or what could I not do that would give me a better chance? Oh, that's a really hard question. That's a really hard question. That's a good one for you. Yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, <laughs> there's so much context here that I don't understand. Like uh, your rainfall and, and your. Heavy. Okay, small grains are going into what kind of stubble? Uh, either corn or beans. What kind of small grains? Oats into corn, wheat into beans. Okay. Wow. What can you do? Holy smokers. You need to drink a beer off that one. Yeah, that one. Uh, are, you, are you growing it with the intention of harvesting that crop for that same seed? Yes. Are you using covers behind? Like, are you interceding? Like, I'm wondering, like, it sounds like you're too wet, right? Yeah. So, are you using all your water? I mean, that's something I learned from Dr. Beck, right? We know, are we going to balance our water use? I mean, that's, if, that, if that's out of whack, then it's hard to balance anything. I mean, I have the opposite problem. I want to grow more stuff, but I'm short of water. And I mean, and so I think that's a good place to start if you can get more things growing before you get to that point, because it's hard to hard to fix it once it's, you know what I mean? It's like, 
that's like the same problem I had with not spreading my residue. You got to start with the combine, right? We got to spread a residue and then we can do a good job of seeding the next spring. So if you can kind of get prepared to that point, that might give you a lot more success. Mm -hmm. Where were you located again? Uh, right around here. Right around here. What's your rainfall? <laughs> oh, wow. How many? 30. You had 30 this year? You'd think you would have had 80, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we get 34 inches of rainfall and we just use maybe higher seeding rates and more diversity within your blend. Who's to say you don't have to plant, and I don't want the competition, but, but rye and barley together with five or six other companions right along with it and plant it at a high seeding rate and get some diversity in there and try to mm -hmm. use that to help your plants be healthier so that they can combat the disease and use up more of that moisture. You know, and I would, if you're not able to fly it on, then I would have that, I would have the drill in the same field. I don't know how many times I chase my son around or have somebody chasing him when he's got the combines out there. And he gets all stressed out because we are literally right on his ass sometimes <laughs> to keep something in there. Because I hate that, that spell of time when you don't have something green growing. Yeah, so that's where like the, the companion planting I talked about. So like if there was a clover with your beans or something that would bridge that gap and then it's growing. And, and the downside of those is they're not wicked awesome for biomass producers, but it's something that's, that's using water and something to drive on. So then maybe you could get a cover into that, right. you know, and, and then start using your water or, or seed a fall crop into that, yeah. you know. Well, yeah, I've been doing that, so, but like, like this, this spring, I mean, so can you just mix in a few species with that small grain? I mean, Maybe we're too far north for winter, right? No, we grow it. Yeah. Oh, that's a, yeah, there's a million things that we can talk about. Yeah, um, but one of the things that we've noticed too with small grains, and, and we're not super wet, but I, I notice going to wider rows that I, I think my cereal crops are, are healthier. And I'm, I'm going against it, what everybody else says about you know, yield and whatnot with row spacing and cereals, but we've gone to lower seeding rates and wider rows and I'm happier. So on air movement, you know, sunlight penetration to the bottom leaves, all those things happen. So I'm not sure what spacing you're on, but that might help. Because if you're in a, I mean, if you've got a lot of fusarium in your system, I'm guessing, so I mean, oats into, that could be a problem, oats into corn. You know, there's mm -hmm. a whole bunch of things that could be going wrong there. I'm gonna get you guys can beat me up on this, okay? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna expose myself. I'm Please a don't. I'm a believer in what you're saying. Okay, so we had a what I'm gonna call a full season cover crop, well speaking. So what it was gonna do is we planted the first of July, grazed in July for our herb cows. So it's a it's really an experiment for us. It's 160 acres. We left strips in it with no nitrogen nitrogen strips. The rest of it I put 25 units in on. My soil sampled the field before we started. We had 15 pounds in. Hemp grass double. 4.8% organic batter. 20, at that time it was 25 years of no-till. Where we, where we put the 25 pounds, 25 units of in on, we had 16, 1,600 pounds more biomass and 1% more protein. Now, I understand I'm supposed to be drinking the Kool-Aid, but if I would have if I would have cut back and not put anything on that cover crop, we would have lost probably four days grazing on that quarter section. Okay, you put the money to this, so did I do the right thing? I think there comes a time when a little bit of fertilizer, until I, maybe I'm not active enough, we've had covers on that field and the, didn't really start planting covers until 2005. And so we've, been down, we've had covers on it three years. Long time. In the rotation, I rotate my covers just behind weed. So, I mean, uh, how do I do that? So I go cold turkey and tell the cows they don't quite have enough to eat. <laughs> and there's always heavy residue on it. There's always soil cover on it. There's always residue on it. Mm -hmm. I do the same thing. Do I, I do put some nitrogen on I do the same thing. I do put some nitrogen on. I like ammonium sulfate a lot. Uh, don't need very much. I don't ever put on over 30 pounds yeah. per acre on any acre, and I can say ever now. I've been doing that a couple of years. What is 
I don't ever put on more than that in, in one application. But I occasionally will do another one. You know, of actual. It just depends on the crop and, and what I've got going on. Because my goal is sustainability, and I'm not sustainable without profit. And and I think that everybody has to understand that everybody's system is different. My system and in Oklahoma with all the heat that I have and, and the amount of moisture that I have is different from a system here. So so I am still using some commercial fertilizers. I don't like it, I hate writing a check. And I hope and I think that there is a biological answer to every problem that we're currently using chemistry to fix. I really believe that's true. Maybe I'm not smart enough to have figured it all out, obviously, yet. But I'd like to get to that point. And I would have the exact same response that you have uh, in my multi-species summer blends. If I put nothing on, they're not going to grow as well. I'm probably building better soil. I probably am. Dad, well, he, he, he's got a good, a good, good ground. So, Dave, can I just um, just go back to what you said before? You, you put 25 units of M. You mean like what kind of M was it? It was urea. So you mean like 50 pounds per acre, roughly, of urea? Correct. And you put it on some of the land and some of it you didn't put on? We left strips in that. We left strips in the field. The majority of it was fertilized. We okay. Strips in the you field. left strips in the field. You could visually see it. Yeah. I've got pictures of it. You could visually see it. That's fine. How do you know you got more animal production from where you had more biomass? How do I have more? How do you know hmm, that that's a good question. In the field that grew more biomass? That's a good question. Because okay. I've seen places, just to give you an example, here in the United States where there might be something like, um, what's that brome? Is it sweet? Um, Who is brome? Smooth brome. Um, that's, I think, people say it needs a lot of in, right? And I've seen where it's been, you know, like, um, like from here, if this was the ground, like this high, we eat on it, and then people have cut the end and it's like only been this high and actually got more animal production from it when it was this high because it had much higher nutrient density. And when it was this high, it's because the end has elongated the cells that made it grow taller. So you've got more biomass, but that doesn't necessarily equate through to animal live weight gains. And we know for certain with dairy cows that more biomass does not equate to more milk if it's empty, empty calories, basically. But with milk production, where people have cut the end, and got less pasture growth, like a raised, rising plate meter will say, you've only got half the dry matter here, but you're still getting the same or more milk because it's very nutrient dense because now it's got the better root system. So you're saying, where I didn't put the end on, I've got less biomass. My question is, did you actually get less animal production? Because that shorter biomass could have had much higher nutrient density. Okay. So did you fence those off and graze them separately? What it, what it was, it was clipped. This is uh, NRCS helped me with this, so it was clipped. We had two samples, uh, I mean, so, uh, yeah. square yard, and it was clipped, clipped right at the ground and sent yep. to Ward Lab. We got a complete biomass, carbon nitrogen and everything, so we know how much nitrogen <laughs> is in it. Ah, uh, but do you know how much uh, secondary plant compounds were in there? How much what? Polyphenols, um, flavonoids. How much percent of it, nitrogen? How much secondary plant compounds were in that? Yeah. Yeah. So there is a relative feed value to it, but uh, I don't. Which will just be acid detergent, fiber, metabolizable energy. Or, in other words, those measurements that the lab did doesn't actually tell you how well your cows will do on that. It'll just tell you the main things like the protein, you know, the energy, crude fiber, like those kinds of things, acid detergent, fiber, whatever. They're the sorts of measurements that, if it does a feed analysis, that's what the lab will do. If you have a look at Fred Provenza's work, Professor Fred Provenza here in the United States, he wrote a book last, published a book last year called Nourishment. Um, he's very well known. He was a professor at Utah State University. He's now retired. Um, he looks at the secondary plant compounds, the secondary metabolites that are in plants, things like flavonoids and polyphenols and all those sorts of things that are really important for feed conversion efficiency, for the, um, how the rumen actually works. And they are much more important for animal production for live weight gain than um, how much protein. I mean, protein and energy, yes, they're important. You have to have certain levels of them. But your secondary plant compounds are going to be higher 
in the plants that didn't have the nitrogen put on them. So the test that you allowed us to do, unless you actually fence those strips off and looked at live weight gain in those different areas, the biomass is not a very good indicator, unfortunately, of really on your live weight gain. As I said before, you could have a, a crop of something like, like this high, like irrigated and lots of air on it and everything growing this high, doing nothing for your soil. And it won't necessarily be um, the best thing for livestock production either. It's something shorter that's really high in secondary plant compounds has got. In fact, like even for human health, um, there's a guy called Dan Kittrich who's been working over in Massachusetts. Um, and he's been analysing things like carrots and spinach and those sorts of things like for human consumption. And he's found a 200-fold difference in the amount of secondary plant compounds or polyphenols, for example, specifically is what he's looking at in like a carrot grown in an industrial type system, like lots of fertiliser, compared to one grown in a, in a soil that's biologically rich. The one grown in biologically rich soil can have 200 times more secondary plant compounds which are never going to show up on a lab test that just measures protein and energy. That carrot is going to be far more beneficial for somebody to consume. So those shorter plants that may be very rich in secondary plant compounds can actually improve feed conversion efficiency. So that, yes, they still have to have a certain amount of protein and they still have to have a certain amount of energy. There's minimum levels of that and fibre and all those things they have to have. So if you've got nothing there, it's not, you know, you can't feed animals or nothing. But what I'm saying, you can still have half the biomass and produce more long weight gain. And I've seen it. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily create yeah. the And we're seeing it more and more and more. We're doing the science on it now and seeing more and more and more why it is the okay. case. Wouldn't the BRICS evaluation be the best method? Yeah, BRICS will tell you. So, yeah, did, did you do BRICS? Yeah. yeah, BRICS will tell you for sure. Did you do BRICS levels on those plants? What's that? BRICS. Use a refractometer to measure the BRICS levels of those plants. Yeah. What caps I did? Did you measure BRICS levels on the plan? No, 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 no. Um, well, that will tell you more than the lab test. Okay, we're not that bad. Next yeah. time. Next yeah. time, do your BRICS levels. Yeah. And if they're higher, that means that the animals have gained more nutrition from those plants. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, there's almost a direct line relationship between, if you look at a graph of um, bricks percentage along the bottom and um, live weight gain along this axis it's, all, it's almost a straight line of increased percentage bricks is increased pounds of live weight gain okay. and Alan Williams has got that data Okay, I have the last question Sorry to catch up, but we're running out of time I'm doing some bale grid and my intentions are to do a lot more of it with purchase Hey, so the idea that I'm going to build organic matter and import nutrients. Am I right or am I wrong? You'd say he's going to import. <laughs> You're going to import nutrients for sure, but but I don't. I think you could be disappointed by the amount of organic matter you really gain because organic matter is grown uh, through the roots of the of the growing plants. That's where you increase your organic matter the fastest. You know, what, what do you call it, liquid carbon almost? It, as, as a cow will reach down and bite, that plant has an amazing response of liquid carbon because it knows it needs nutrients. That's why it grows 20 some percent faster. So I, I think that you could import nutrients, you could import some, import some residue on top. I think it's a wonderful thing. It's better than, you know, feeding them in a pen all winter, for sure, a lot better. But I don't know how much organic matter gain you're gonna get in that area. I'm probably not the best person to ask that because we don't do it. So what, you, what I have seen where people have been bale grazing is that um, you can see where the bales are being because you get more plant growth because you get a short term um, what we call labile carbon. In other words, the organic right. matter breaks down and as it's breaking down, it's feeding the, the food web. Eventually all the hay that you put there will decompose and go back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. But while it's breaking down, it's feeding the soil food web and plants will grow faster. And those plants that grow faster in that area where you had the hay will produce lots of rudensity dates. Right. So they will, That's you true. will end up with building soil because the plants benefited from the organic matter from the hay. 
And one thing I didn't talk about in my talk is there is a really big difference between organic matter, which is like hay or you know, straw crop residues, all those kinds of things, they break down and decompose and become carbon dioxide. Whereas you really see that it start off as very simple sugars and other carbon compounds and they polymerize and you know, as they build and they become bigger um, structures, stable carbon in the soil. You start with something simple and build it into something complex and it's very stable. With hay and other things like that, you start with like complex carbohydrates that the soil food where breaks them all get into simpler and simpler, simpler ones, they end up being carbon dioxide, they go back to the atmosphere. It's good for the soil while it's there. But when you see those green areas where you've had the hay, that grass that grows more is going to build your soil. So you still will get soil building there, but it'll come from the exudates from the grass that's in there. Makes sense. Thank you. We're done? Yeah. Yes, we're done. We're done. Thank you. Thank you. I think Ruth had one. Oh, does he? No. One more? I don't know. One out here. <coughs> blue sweater. See where Rick Beaver is? Dwayne's right in front of a blue, of blue jeans. And and <laughs> really? Never mind. Do I want to meet him? So I think they'll come off the stage and maybe they'll let you come up and visit with them a little bit here and there, mm -hmm. grab a drink of water. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to remind you, please fill out your surveys. Either if you have a, uh, a he completely changed smartphone, you can scan that mm -hmm. and fill it out electronically oh, or get, fill it out on the paper, just, but that's the only way we can improve so and know what I better go you want to do the next soil <laughs> So it really does help us a lot. Well, let's go meet him. So directors, mm. we're going to go meet Dr. Beck. Beck. <laughs> as we end, um, one last thing I just want to remind you, no, next year is January oh, 7th, really? and it is in here, in 2021. We do have another workshop that we're working with, Right. Um, in February 18th, so in that will be in Redfield. Right. So there is a flyer on the Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.